שלום, שלום, מקארצי. שלום. אז we get ready to begin. I'm open up in prayer and just, you know, say tell our Rabbi, y'all. For your greatness and your graciousness and your mercy and love and kindness and everything that you do for your chosen children of Yasharal. Um, thank you for awakening us to your true Father Yah and revealing your word to us and allowing us to understand maybe not all things, but some of the mysteries, the ones that we are worthy enough to know, um, the ones that we need to know as we move forward into um, and certain times in the world, but because we know you, um, we walk with a surety and all confidence that we'll be okay. Um, I pray for everybody on the call, I'll be out that everyone's well and that they're healthy, that your Ruach is up on everyone in their households, I'll be out, and that you're leading us all on a narrow path. I ask that you send Yahushua Hamashiach our King, Father Yah, the Kinsman Redeemer, to be the lamp and the light, to light us in the shadow of darkness. And as we walk amongst confusion and destruction and ruin and misery, um, keep us under the shadow of thy wing and focused on the heavenly things and above uh, and your word and, and all things that we need to know that pertain to you. Um, we give you all honor, glory, and praise, Abba Yah. Um, and we understand that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in the Shemaim. And we just ask that um, you continue to let your word be fulfilled in our lives. In the name of Yahushua Hamashiach, we ask that your Ruach is amongst us tonight as we pray and we try to um, make understanding of the book of Enoch, um, a prophet of yours. Um, and, and, and that you reveal to us what we need to know and what we need to take from this so that we can build towards growing closer to you um, and being functioning vessels in your tabernacle, if it be your holy will. In the name of Yahushua, we pray. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 So. As we began, so last week <clears throat> we were just talking, like we went over the names of the archangels um, and Enoch is starting to tour the earth in Sheol on his first journey in a vision. Um, we didn't come out of the interaction with the fallen angels and all of that. Them asking Enoch to pray, y'all rebuking them. And then he tell them what their punishment's gonna be. Him telling us that the demons are the spirits of the giants roaming the earth causing all this mayhem and so on and so forth um as we start with chapter 21 it says enoch's second journey preliminary and final place of punishment of fallen stars so he's still going downward as we see here um anybody want to read chapter 21 in its entirety I got it. Go ahead. And I came to an empty place and I saw there neither a heaven above nor an earth below, but a chaotic and terrible place. And there I saw seven stars of the heaven bound together in it like great mountains and burning with fire. At that moment, I said, for which sin are they abound? And for what reason were they cast in there? Then one of the holy angels, Uriel, was with me, guided me, spoke to me and said to me, Enoch, for what reason are you asking? And for what reason do you question and exhibit eagerness? These are among the stars of heaven, which have transgressed the commandments of Yahuwah and are bound in this place until the completion of 10 million years, according to the number of their sins. I then proceeded from that area to another place, which is even more terrible and saw a terrible thing, a great fire that was burning and flaming. The place and the, sorry, 
and flaming, the place had a cleavage that extended to the last sea, pouring out great pillars of fire. Neither is extent nor its magnitude could I see, nor was I able to estimate. At that moment, what a terrible opening in this place and pain to look at. Then Uriel, one of the holy angels who was with me, responded and said to me, Enoch, why are you afraid like this? I answered and said, I am frightened because of this terrible place and the spectacle of this painful thing. And he said unto me, this place is the prison house of the angels. They are detained here forever. That sound like the lake of fire. <laughs> See why I ain't want to think about it. I could even scare it Enoch. <laughs> Oh, um, some key takeaways here said that there were seven stars and they were like great mountains. I would assume those seven stars are some of the more powerful fallen angels that fell, that y'all bound up and big too, like great mountains burning with fire. He compared them to a volcano in a sense. They were bound. Abiyah said said that they would be bound for 10 million years. That's a long time or punishment of an angel. But that just goes to show when, when Abiyah, remember the angels were in the heavenly abode. Um, when Abiyah allows us into um, his heavenly tabernacle, his true set apart tabernacle, you know, there's repercussions when we break bad from that. It's a scripture in Hebrews that says that for those that come into the truth, there is no more remission of sins. Basically once Abiyah shows you everything that he's showing you, you know, we gotta get this thing together. And the angels are an example of that because they knew better and still chose to do what they wanted. Now, that's not saying that you won't mess up, but knowing better and choosing to do what you want to do is different than being ignorant of some things and maybe stumbling, right? 10 million years for them. And then he said he saw another terrible place. He had a great fire, burning flame, had a cleavage that extended to the last sea. I'm assuming it's like a cliff or something over this fire where he may have been standing and looking. Or he saw this uh, uh, pouring out of a, a, a really hot fire into this place. Um, he couldn't estimate the magnitude of it, meaning it was so big and so wide and just so uh, the depth of it and all of that was so great. He couldn't estimate it. And it scared him. And Uriel said, this place is the prison house of angels. They are detained here forever, which... I think it's Matthew 24, where it says the lake of fire was for Hasatan and the angels. And basically man have, has worked themselves into that punishment. It wasn't created for them, but I believe this possibly is the lake of fire, but you know, there's levels to even, just like his levels to heaven, his levels to hell. So this could be another level before we even get there. But any questions or comments as we open up to chapter 21? Feel free. Go ahead, it's on you. Always gotta be the first one, always gotta ask the question. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, verse one, it says, and I became to an empty place and I saw there neither a heaven above nor an earth below, but a chaotic and terrible place. And I saw there seven stars of the heaven bound together. And like, I think about the seven stars and um, the seven spirits of Yah. Cause in Revelations 3.1, uh, it talks about like the seven, when you said about the seven stars, I did like a huge study on like this before and it has something to do, well, I looked at it and I, I wanted to ask anyone, you know, about the seven spirits and um, the seven stars, which sits on, I do believe they they spoke of it for, I forgot what what uh, book is it? Because I know it speaks about it in Estras as well. But um, I wanted to ask about Revelations 3.1. When he said unto the angel of the church of Sardis, write, these things said he that had the seven spirits of Yah and the seven stars. I know thou works, that thou hast a name, that thou liveth and art dead. But the seven stars is kind of relating to the seven spirits. But then we go to Revelations 2.1. And then it says unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things said he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden hand candlesticks. Um, then we see Revelation 120, where it says, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, 
and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou saw are the seven churches, the seven, seven congregations. Um, I was looking at that and I, don't, I wanted, I wanted y'all to jump in on that. I just wanted a little bit of insight of what y'all found for far as the seven stars and um, you know, what was you seeing, you know, as far as what we see here in Revelations with Enoch. I didn't even, <laughs> that was just beyond me. Um, quick question. Do you believe that these seven stars over these churches are the same as the seven stars that Enoch is saying is bound up here? And no, that's they're not. I, no, they're not. No, they're not. I mean, no, I, I believe no, that they're not. The, the seven stars, which are the seven spirits, I, I always thought them to be the seven angels. Okay. I don't. I, I didn't think of them to be no the, the fallen. I don't think they're a part of the fallen at all. I think they work strictly for the Most High. Um, I think they are the seven arch, arch angels. Mm, okay. I don't know. Maybe Kiefer, do you got something else for us? I let's be honest. Yes. So let me give you a little bit to help you. You know, this is, stay stay there where you are for a second. Um, to help you unlock this a little bit, right? So. Revelations 120, it says, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my hand, in my right hand, right? So first you have to determine um, who's speaking. Go go back, go up to Revelations 1.1. 1, 1. Right. Right. So Revelations 1.1 1, 1 says it's the revelation of Yahushua HaMashiach, right? So it's his revelation, which Elohim gave unto him. So Elohim gave Yahushua HaMashiach this revelation mm -hmm. to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified by his Malak, Malak unto his servant Yehukanah, right? So when you go back to 120, you understand because of this in the beginning, in 1 1, you understand that this is Yahushua, the mystery of the seven stars. That's why it's in red also, which thou sawest in my right hand. Right. So the whole revelation was a revelation. It's the revelation of um, Yahushua, which was given to him by Yahuwah. Right. So let's go to where was it? Two one. Pardon me. Yeah. And it's it's saying unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Right. So Yahushua is telling um, the angel of the church of Ephesus to write these things. And you'll see the same wording in three one. unto the angel of the church of Sardis, right? So this is Yahushua instructing the, the, the Malachim um, of these churches to write, to write these things. Now we can go back to Enoch. And then Enoch, you know, it's saying, I saw there neither a Shamayin above nor a Retz below, but a chaotic and terrible place, an awesome place. Um, in this instance, um, terrible, normally when you see terrible in the script, it doesn't always mean terrible. Um, but in this instance, it seems like it is a, 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 a place of terror, a place of awe, um, you know, those things. And I saw seven stars of Shamaim bound together in it, right? So why would they be bound, right? Mm -hmm. Like great mountains and burning with fire. And at that moment, I said, for which sin are they bound and for which reason where they cast here, right? So I agree with Octre that this place that he's seeing here is more likely the place, um, you know, portion of the place where um, they were bound, these Malachim were bound earlier in Enoch, I believe 10, maybe, maybe it was 10, they were bound there. And when we talked about the cauldron, um. <laughs> it seemed like we'd have been through so much. We only have right. 21. <laughs> um, yeah, he did come around now. Maybe it was nine. Because I think he's talking to y'all there. Yeah. yeah, and it may be, it may be different. And maybe... It's 10 in yours. You got one out. I'm looking. Oh, it is. You were right. You were right. And he made a hole in the desert, which was Dudael. Yep, Dudael. Right. So this is more than likely the same place. 
Now in 21, what the fact that it's saying that these are these are great. Um, trying to make sure I've got the wording right. There were great mountains, right? He goes on further in this to say, you know, right there where your mouse is, these are among the, the stars of Shamayim, which have transgressed the commandments of Yahuwah. Now, what I think you may be looking at here, one idea of what you may be seeing here is actually the reason why it's calling them great mountains and they're burning with fire. It's possible that they're seraphim. True. If you understand what seraphim and seraphim are serpent-like, um, serpentine-like malachim, um, and they are also known, um, they are also associated with with fire, right? The the word fire um, when you when you look at seraph. Yep. A burning. True. Yep. Yep. So it's possible that what you're seeing is seraphim and. They are some of the, you know, if you believe in angiology, they will be the upper echelon of, of you know, in the hierarchy of Malachim. Um, so it's it's not the same um, seven Malachim that you see in Revelation. This is a different seven Malachim. Hallelujah. Thank you. I was drawing a blank. <laughs> hey, yo, that was that that was a good way to start, man. I was that was beyond me, but this was this. Just everything about this is a heavy statement. Um, just made me think about something in, in um, Revelation as well. When he was talking to these churches, he wasn't necessarily talking to the people. He was talking to the angels that were supposed to be handling these people in a certain way and what they were passing down, the doctrines that they were passing. Um, it was just an idea I just got as you were talking in Revelation. Um, both of you, but yeah, these angels done done something that made y'all really mad. And they in a place that's chaotic. And I agree, terrible doesn't always mean terrible as we know in English. Sometimes terrible can just mean something to be feared, right? Because I think it's a scripture that would be like, I'll be y'all terrible in this. And the word terrible there just means like something to be feared, not necessarily um, bad. Well, I guess. We are not necessarily bad in the sense that we would look at the word terrible. Hallelujah. Thank you for clearing that up as well. Um, go ahead. We have hands up. Um, Nahimi and Lauren. Um, yes, I have a question on the um, angels as well. And um, I like, I guess this is just from my own understanding i always thought the angels were like the people that were put um as leaders over those churches rather than little um literal angels i'm sorry literal angels mm. so i just wanted to know what your thoughts are on, on that because i never um i never thought of them as actual um uh, malachim that that were um like over the churches as in like in the spirit realm I always thought of it as like apostles or people who were head over those churches hallelujah I actually think it could be both you know I'm gonna have to go back and read that over not at all this thing that's what I like about these man because I'm actually gonna have to go back and read the beginning of revelation over um because I think in the physical it could be the people over those churches but also in the spiritual it could be Melakim slash spiritual beings that Abiyah has put over, you know what I'm saying, to um, convey these messages to um, the physical beings that are over these churches. It could, I, I, yeah, that's true. It could go either way. Um, I'm going to have to read that over again because I never really looked at it like that myself either um, until what they just brought out from this chapter 21. So if anybody else could speak to that, but that's just an idea that I have. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's just an ideal. I would have, I have to read that over. I'm going to read that over. Yeah, I would, I would say off at the top of my head, and I, and I, I understand the question. Um, it's, it's more related to like, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if, if your question is more related to like Malachim meaning messenger. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so if we can go back to Revelations one one, so uh, yes, it, you know, Malachim 
does mean messenger. Sure. Um, and what happens is the, the New Testament is a great injustice because you're hard pressed to find the breakdown in Hebrew in the New Testament because you know, all they really give us is, is the Greek, right? So in the Old Testament, when you, the way you could discern whether it was a, a Malachim was being used as a messenger or it was Malachim um, being used as an, uh, an angel, it would say uh, Malach Yahuwah, right? True. An angel of Yahuwah or Malach Elohim, an angel of Elohim, right? So again, you would go to 1-1 one, one, and you would see in 1-1, one, one, it says that, you know, Elohim gave this to Yahusha, um, and then Yahusha is giving these to, you know, he sent and signify it by his Malak. So that, that would be Malak Yahusha, right? Or Malak Yahusha. So I would say that this is a true angel and not a person. Um, and that's going to make a difference as you read two and then three, um, as he's speaking to the seven churches, right? You know, so you, cause you're going to refer back to one, one. You know, this is Yahusha speaking unto the Malik of the church, right? And it was, it's giving by, you know, given from him to his Malik. So that's, that's how I, I would break that down. But that's a good question. No, that is a good question. Like I say, I, that's something I would have to read again. I'm going to read it again and, and just see if I could peel at it. But Torah Rabbah, key for what you just said. Um, this is the definition of what they have the angel in the Greek here, and it speaks to what the Og just said. It says a messenger, especially an angel by implication, but it can also be a pastor. Um, so I can see the spiritual and the human implication that he's right. These breakdowns are better in Hebrew. Um, and you are right again in Hebrew. A lot of times it'll say the angel of Yah or something along those lines to kind of show the difference. Um, yeah, because I, I think there are scriptures in the Old Testament as well when it may have been talking to the prophets or something and said it was the prophet was a messenger of Yah, and it's the same word, Melachim, as well. So I def, that was a really good question. I understand. Um, I can I, I totally understand what you were getting at. I told out Akba's response. And like I say, I have to, I'm going to have to read that over again myself because you all just put an ideal in my mind that I never really had. Um, it's on you, Lauren. All right, this is going to be my last question. I, I'm going to stop messing with Kappa. I just want to ask one more question. Okay, so this when we see the revelations, when he said, okay, the mystery of the seven stars, which is in Revelation 120, when he said, thou solve in the right hand is the seven golden sticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks. Um, but then I was, I was checking that out because the seven angels, of course, they bring the plagues. They um, also take the vows, the seven golden vows. Um, they also minister out, you know, the seven trumpets as well. I was going to say, do you, well, when we looking at basically that type of feel of what the seven or they have or the seven sets, I wanted to ask, well, those angels or the ones we see there um, that brings on the end, would that relate to that or no? It may sound like a dumb question, but I'm asking because I need it for a study. Ask it again. Okay. The seven angels, the ones with the vows that we see here when it says the seven, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou saw in the, my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven hold, stars. Hold, 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 hold tight for a second. So let's, let's do it real slow as we're going through it, right? So he has these seven, the Yahusha has these seven stars in his right right hand signifying that they're to be utilized for his strength for his power right so he has he has these malachim in his hand okay now go ahead okay <laughs> all right so then um it says the seven stars which thou saw in his right hand and the seven golden candlesticks Okay, so the seven, seven golden candlesticks are, right, so they're the menorah, they're the light, right, they're the light, you know, in the world at this time. Now, the one thing you have to remember is this is a vision, right, so this is him explaining to Yehukanan what he's seeing in this vision, mm -hmm. right, and this is probably why he's seeing it as stars and candlesticks and, 
you know, it's a vision. So, okay. And then it says, <laughs> the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou saw are the seven churches. Right. So what, well, when it said the seven congregations, because as we know, you know, um, we're scattered all abroad. There are going to be different congregations of um, the people that do come together in your name. And then they, you also have the chastising of the, the seven churches from mm -hmm. the beginning of the revelations that goes down each chapter. I was trying to ask, like, well, it, when it says those seven congregations, is it is it speaking for those that he's correcting or through them? Or is that the, basically the one that worship him in spirit and truth? He's speaking, he's speaking, he's giving him, um, my answer would be that the seven churches that you see are seven physical churches. Um, I think there's been okay. studies showing that those seven physical churches um, existed at the time uh, um, Yehukana, um was having this, this vision, right? But the message, um, the underlying message is, is for, for all of us and, and all churches, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, we can't, there is a literal message in Revelation, um, but it's being relayed in a spiritual manner. Um, so what it would behoove us to do is to understand the, the spiritual impl implications of what he's telling you, Hukunan, and apply that to our lives, right? So, mm. you know, but it's also future prophecy at the same time. Portions of it. Y'all done started off with a bang, all this beyond me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that it's, it's, it's you know, and, and we all have this issue sometimes. We try to look at these things literally and then apply them physically, right? These, you know, as, churches and assembly, right? We know that. Um, I'm sure there's seven assemblies in the earth right now that that are lights to the world. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they may not all be in America. I, I would doubt very seriously they're all in America. Sure. Um, so we don't know that we're we have the we have the benefit of having Yahukana's vision written down for us that will will trigger us when we see these things, but there's no way that we can look at it from an overall view right now to see these things, if that makes sense. We experience that as it, we can't see it in third person as it happens. True. Not we can true. only, we can only understand, understand it as it's, as it's being revealed. Does that, does that make sense, Akoti? It's like when they talk about like a Monday morning quarterback, you know, it's easier to be the quarterback Monday morning when you're going back over the highlights than it is when you actually in the pocket and people running at you. Right, right. So that's the same reason, right? I'll give you a better example of, of what I'm trying to explain. We see things like the virus going on now and these certain laws put into effect. We can say this looks like what the Most High was showing Yahukanon in Revelation. We cannot say that, hey, this happened that definitely means that this is going to happen and then this is going to happen. We can't see it that way. Right. True indeed, Aki. True indeed. And it's normally the spiritual one that controls the natural. If you guys see what um, Oxan put in, put in the chat, um, the, the, the spiritual is superior to the natural. Um, so... Hopefully, I didn't confuse everybody with what I just said. No, it, they, they go. I didn't confuse nobody. Look, that's why I asked the question. No, because I want it completely flushed out because people tied back to that. But that's why I said we'll be the seven congregations. Yeah, Oxan, don't be I, sitting over there trying to be quiet, Ox. I know you got an angle to this. You might as well. Oh, no, nah, please speak jump up. in. We're going to jump in on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, please don't be shy. Get back right. here. That's why I said get back here, Kevin. No, I got another question. Let go. Let go. the <laughs> point. Um, it could be both, like you said, right? The seven stars could really be seven spiritual beings that were commissioned to look after these, these golden sticks, these lights that are supposed to be in the world, right? And they could also be physical pastors that's over them physically, but there is a spiritual nature, as Oxam said, to everything. Um, and what, 
the beauty in script, you know, the gift and the curse with scripture, I should say. And I don't know if anything's a curse, but the, the good and the bad thing with scripture is there is multiple ways to look at scripture. The reason that's good is because that's how we peel off the layers of scripture, but all of the layers need to be focused on the same thing. The bad in that is, is people who aren't truly rooted in scripture. That's how you'll get, well, this scripture mean this to you and that scripture mean that to me and we just gonna leave. No, no, no. The scripture mean the same thing, but there is layers to um, the scriptures. And, and, and like I say, I have to read this over because I never thought about this like that. So I really don't have an angle, but I can see where this could mean both things. Um, just like there was a menorah in the physical temple with the Ark of the Covenant. We know there's an altar, a menorah, and all of that in Yah's heavenly tabernacle. He didn't have that wooden box with gold when he said in Revelation, my Ark is in the tabernacle and you can see it. No, he's talking about the spiritual representation of it, which is the most important one because it's the one that's everlasting, right? It's um, the altar up there where the prayers and the saints were under the altar and the incense. That, that was a spiritual implication of what was in the temple on earth, you know? So it, 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 it this, it, I never thought about it like this, but as we're reading this, I see this in the same manner that I saw that. Um, and Toda Rabah, for all of the questions and for you all bringing that out, I actually, um, y'all got my wheels spinning here, but I'm gonna stay to myself till I got a better understanding. I have to go back and read this over. <laughs> But yeah, it just does because unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, these things say of he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And also at the same time that this is being written, we understand that Shaul is going out to these places, establishing, um, I don't know if establish is the right word, but he's going out to these places, talking to these different people and for lack of a better word, establishing these churches at the time of this being written, right? So- I think Shaul's dead at this time. Oh, so he didn't die. So he has done established these places because he's the one went to these places, the Kepha and the other- Right, right, yeah, the-, the, the um, Okay. The, yeah, the Talmudin are definitely the ones that went out, um, you know, and a lot of it was Shaul. Um, to these places, but at this time, he's, I think he's not alive. Okay. Um, so he's you know, according, according to the timing that the world tells us. Um, I think this is like, you know, closer to like 90 um, to 100 AD um, is, is when this is being written down. Okay. Um, yeah. So he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's gone by that, by that. But I mean, yeah, that's, that's, um, you know, I wanted to say one other thing, um, how you were talking about the layers. Do you, so I, it's the name is eluding me right now, but it, the Holy of Holies, mm -hmm. the area right outside of the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. Yahusha is the menorah that's in that area. Agreed. He's also the, the bread that's on the, on the, the, he's also the bread. Agreed. He's also the blood that's on the, the mercy seat. Agree. Right, so you, you see those different layers, like they mean certain things, but they all point to one thing, as we always say. And that's, that's the gift, because when we peel the layers, it should all point to one thing. The bad is what the world done deal with scripture. Now, people who aren't completely rooted in the truth of the scriptures, they'll use that same thought process and say, well, where it says that Kepha saw when Yah told Kepha, don't, don't, nothing is unclean that I have made. Well, to you, that mean don't eat nothing unclean. But to me, that mean I can eat pork. You see what I'm saying? So that we also have to be careful with that too. Right, right. Mimi, like and, um, Mimi and Yahu, uh, Yahu Kana, what, what, um, what, can you elaborate on your, on your statements? That's definitely how you get that as well. Oh, he just was saying his wheels were turning, and I was saying I was thinking I, it made me think a bunch of different thoughts of when you guys went into the revelations of things I've seen, but I can't remember exactly 
what question I want to ask because I saw some things when I was reading before a while ago and so I don't know exactly where it is so I have to go back and reread but it definitely had my wheel spinning about the different things you were pulling out in Revelation. So. Yeah and it's when when I, when you know this is almost like he what Yahusha is telling these these angels to write is almost in the same vein or the same pattern as a prophet right so in 2 2 where it says right so in 2 1 he's telling uh, the malachim write this right write these things in 2 2 it's speaking almost like he's speaking to a person i know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou cannot bear them which are evil this i as i'm looking at it is the establishment of a witness. It doesn't necessarily mean, so this Malik, this Malachim, um, he set over these churches to, to guide them. It's, it's, a, it's you know, to, to um, stir up their ruach, to do, to do certain things, to um, be obedient, you know? You know, that's, that's what this is. So the statement in 2.2, is more like a witness, if that makes sense. It's a witness in the earth, right? Hey, you guys are doing good things, but you know, you, you don't like them that do evil. Um, the ones that say they're apostles that are not, right? You know, but I have this against you. You know, you're, you're, you do this and you do that. You know, you hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Um, so this is a witness in the earth. Okay, see, even you saying that, I have a theory about those churches and and that just you saying that there's a witness within those churches and her, uh, I believe her name is Naomi, bringing out the fact that a Malachim can also be uh, a person, it, it can be a person and an angelic being at the same time it, it makes me think of thought but again I, i'm just gonna hold my peace because it's making me go a certain way and the fact that you just said the thought about them bearing witness it almost makes me feel like there's somebody just what you're saying there's somebody within these churches that you don't even know that could be a person that's just there to bear witness to what's happening and go back yeah. to get to the father so. hallelujah yeah the script says that you you know you know there's been times that you entertain angels unawares right and so you know what she's saying is exactly true the word means messenger who who the most high uses to deliver that message is up to the most high it could be a malachim it could be a person it could be a malachim appearing as a person it could be both as she said Right, but in its truest form, it's, it means messenger. Interesting, interesting thoughts. It's all you, Nahimi. Oh, okay. Um, I sorry, I didn't, I didn't want to jump in. I heard you say my name, but I didn't. I didn't want to just jump in. But um, I was gonna just say um, like my thought process behind that. Um, and I I I agree with um Kifa, as well. Um going to say that um like just to give an example and um verse okay i'll use verse two and three as revelation two and three as example um where it says um i know i know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst bear not them which are evil and thou has tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has fainted not. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. So um, that, for example, I'm like when I'm hearing that, I'm I'm seeing when like when he says um, to the angels of the you know churches, right? I'm seeing it as um an angel who is um over that church but is is um inspired inspiring a certain individual to write these things to these churches just how the you know how the prophets they were um 
filled with the um the Holy Spirit when they were um writing down the scriptures I feel like these letters were also um inspired by whether it was the um angels or whether it was Yahusha um I feel like they they were inspired um to write these by that angel or or that um that Melech, that's what you, how you say it, Melech, over that. But I feel like it was still a certain person who was the messenger to the church. Because I don't know if angels have ever come before an assembly before to deliver a message to a, a, a group of people. I mean, if there is a situation where that's happened, I mean, I don't know of it, but if you guys do, you can enlighten me. But that's that's just my thought process. So I, I have had an experience. Um, I have had an experience before, um, not, not like this. Um, but to answer your question, it, the way this is so, and this is one of the most difficult things, like when you're reading Revelations and, you know, Daniel and Ezekiel and some of these things, one of the, one of the hardest things to do is to, I, I want to make sure I word this correctly. You have to train yourself to understand, like Oxfam brought out, that there's a spiritual layer and a natural layer, right? And you have to understand the spiritual layer is superior. Now, this being written, so first, this is a vision um, to Yehukanah. That's spiritual. Um, Yahusha, um, we know him. We, we, we have him in spirit now. That's spiritual. He's telling Amalekim, that's spiritual. Write these things. So here's, here's where it all comes together. Even when the Malachim writes it, it's spiritual. And understanding that, once he writes it, it is superior to the physical. You ever, um, I be, so I believe Yahuwah is, is omniscient, is all-powerful, all-knowing, right? You could, you could be somewhere and you can tell yourself, you ever tell yourself, I want to do this, but then for some reason you can't do it mm -hmm. because that thing has been ordained in the spiritual realm. So even this walking, right? So when, you know, even this, this being written, um, when he says, can you scroll down, Aki? Where he's talking about turn back to your, right? And I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just giving you a different way to, to, to try to see it. Even when he's mm -hmm. telling this Malachim, you know, turn back, you know, tell the church to, um, to, to turn back to your first love, mm -hmm. right? And he's telling them to write that down. That's something being manifested or, or set in motion in the spiritual. And then the natural will follow. True. Mm -hmm. I, I understand what you're saying. That kind of reminds me of, that kind of reminds me of, like when you said that, that kind of reminds me of this um, movie that I watched. You probably, you probably seen it before, The Secret, where they were saying that, um, that things are, are written, they were saying the same thing, things are written in the spiritual and it manifests as people's destiny. So is, you mean it in that aspect that it's written in the spiritual so that, um, I guess, so that, things that are meant to be will happen in the physical yes I, i'm saying that i'm saying that me being me being woken up had nothing to do with me true right it was yeah. written so it had to be ordained somewhere mm -hmm. me coming to the truth had nothing to do with me right yeah and yeah you know, i agree with you. this revelation 2 4 actually speaks um, I agree. Verse two, two and two, three do sound like it could be talking to a man as a witness. But then verse two, four speaks like it's speaking to an angel. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou has left thy first love. Man's, especially at this time, Yasharal, 
their first love was not Yahuwah and Yahushua. The world had become wicked. Mm -hmm. Angels first love is, it has always been Yahuwah. That's why it talks about them transgression against their first estate. And like I say, I have to read this over. I'm not even saying that as a concrete statement, but that's just an example. Um, you also said you, um, has there ever been an angel to go before a congregation with a message? There has been quite a few. I'm not going to bring them up because we need to move on whenever, whenever this ideal is passed by. But um, A, when they were in the wilderness, Moshe on the mountain told Yah, um, will you come with us? There's people higher headed. I know they ain't going to listen. He told them, I'm going to send my angel before you, which is the fiery pillar, which I believe that to be Yahushua, but still, you know, that's an example of Yah sending an angel, which I believe to be Yahushua though, but he sent something other than himself. And he said that he will not forgive your sins, watch what you do, and so right. on and so forth. Another time where I believe is Yahushua again, but it just says an angel of Yah is in Zechariah when they're picking the priests after they come out of Babylon. Um, mm -hmm. The priest's name is Yahushua and it said Hasatan was standing nearby. He sent an angel to deliver that message to pick the priest though, you know? So that's another time and I believe that angel also was Yahushua. I could be wrong, though. Um, but that's just another example of Abiya sending um, entities other than himself personally uh, to go holler at a body of people. Now, to be a Malachim and live in the heavenly abode, though, the reason why Abiya, I assume, forgive me, Abba, for assuming, but... <laughs> I assume that the reason he will do that is because to be in the Shemaim, you have to be lockstep with Yah. It's not like sending a man. You see what I'm saying? You right. can't be in the Shemaim unless you completely committed to Yah, which is why the fallen angels had to go. There is no um, differences of opinion in the Shemaim. If you're in the Shemaim, that means you're, because the Shemaim is the tabernacle of Yah, the spiritual mm -hmm. one. So if you're in my tabernacle in the Shemaim, then you have to be perfect. Like Abraham, I'm holding men to be perfect. So if I'm holding Abraham and Enoch and them and Noah, you know what I'm saying? They righteous in all their generations. Then you angels definitely better be because you know me better than them. You've seen mm -hmm. me. You've seen my glory in a different light, <laughs> so to speak. Right. If I can say one last thing, Aki, like if you were alive at this time and you knew, knew of these churches and I'll just use you know, a couple of, couple of quick examples, right? Um, if you knew these churches and you, you know, you, you see this one church and you're like, man, when they first started, they was on fire for the most high, but they're, they're not like that anymore. And then you see this other church and you're like, they just eat things, sacrifice the idols. And they're just like, like we see now, everybody's sleeping with everybody inside of that church. And then you and yourself see those churches change from those ways. Right. You see the first church that I mentioned do the things that they did at first. Then you see the second church uh, repent and turn away from eating things sacrificed to idols and committing sexual sin. Right. So you see these things physically. What you're seeing in Revelation is the spiritual process beyond it, behind it. You're seeing beyond beyond the veil. True. And even when you get down here to Revelation 2.8. Unto the angel, which could mean spiritual being or physical being, a man as a pastor in Smyrna, you know, I know thou works in a tribulation and poverty. Okay, that may be Israel. They've been starting to be scattered by this time. We've had already been being scattered for a while, um, at least 100 years by this time. I know y'all in poverty. I know the blasphemy of them that call themselves Yehudian and are not, or Israelites but are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. You didn't have nobody claiming to be Israel at this time that was not. Right. So um, that also speaks to a spiritual thing. You know, what I mean, so it, it, it's levels to this. It's levels to this. These are really good questions. I don't know how we got here from seven angels bound. It would look like the lake of fire, but it's a reason why the Ruach brought us here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But this is a level to this. I'm going to have to read this over. Told out of y'all for, for putting this on my mind. I'm always up to read some of it. But there is a level. And I never just, I never really thought about it like that. But there is a level. But getting back to this Enoch. 
if y'all are through with that. Anybody got anything else to say about chapter 21? <laughs> Hallelujah. So chapter 22. Uh, well, I'll pick this one up. Chapter 22. So Enoch is still traveling the earth, man. He didn't saw quite a few places. Um, this place had him scared, though. This one we just passed. So now it says, then he went into another place. And he showed me on the west side a great and high mountain of hard rock. And now we understand, you know, and this is this is why I do this when I read this a lot. The way they are liking mountains and pillars, and we know that they can also mean angels. You know, I always keep that in mind as I read this. Was this a high mountain of hard rock or was this a big angel? You know what I mean? Like, um, it is not always like that, but I always try to keep that in mind as I read, because sometimes with that understanding, it helps it all uh, make more sense. And he says, it was a great and high mountain of hard rock and inside it four beautiful corners. It had in it a deep, wide and smooth thing which was rolling over. So it was like a big stone, I'm assuming, um, that was rolling over. And it, the place was deep and dark to look at. So now he's looking in, and remember the last place was chaotic and terrible, but it was fire. This place is just dark, right? And now, now, that, now that we've read a little bit more, it sounds like he's actually talking about what we would look at as a physical mountain and not a beam. At that moment, Raphael, one of the holy angels who was with me, and that's crazy because he named it different ones. Y'all done sent him down here with some powerful angels. Like y'all take, think about the, 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 it said that Enoch was perfect when he said he translated him. But just, just, just as we read this, keep in mind, look at what y'all is doing for Enoch in these visions. He's sending some of his most powerful Melachim to guide Enoch um, through this journey. At that moment, Rufiah, one of the holy angels, or Kodesh Melachim, who was with me, responded to me. And he said to me, these beautiful corners are here in order that the spirits of the souls of the dead shall assemble unto the, into them. So when people die, they go to these, these four places inside this mountain. Right? They are created so that the souls of the children of people should gather here upon death, I'm assuming. They prepared these places in order to put them, the souls of the people, there unto the day of their judgment and the appointed time of the great judgment upon them. Once again, this is alluding to when people die, they go to these places, and he's going to show a difference here. Hallelujah. I saw the Ruachs of the children of the people. Uh, who were dead and their voices were reaching unto heaven until this very moment. So the people are dead, but yet their voices are still being heard in heaven, which is funny because, you know, it talks about how when you die, men, I always thought that to be ironic in scripture. A lot of times men would say, and somebody could correct me if I'm wrong. I you never hear Yahushua say that once you die, you can't pray anymore. Men always say that, though, if I die, even David would say it in Psalms, if I die and I go into the earth, who's going to repent for me and my voice won't be heard. And, you know, men would talk, but I, I don't I cannot remember one time when Yahushua actually said that, because this goes against that. They're dead, yet their voices are still reaching to heaven until this very moment. I asked Raphael, the angel who was with me and said to him, that's why we are. Pause. That's why we are to praise him in life and in death all the time. Because Abba Yah is everywhere and he can always hear us. Hallelujah. We get that same sense with the in Revelation with the saints that's been martyred under the um, altar. Here's to, he's still hearing their voices and they've been killed as well. But, you know, this is just an idea. This spirit, the voice of which is reaching unto the Shemaim like this and is making suit, whose Ruach is it? And he answered to me saying, this is the spirit which had left a bell whom Cain or Khan, his brother had killed. It continues to sue him until all of, uh, until all of Khan's or Cain, however you pronounce it, seed is exterminated from the face of the earth. And his seed has disintegrated from among the seed of the people. So Abel was testifying against his brother all the time before the flood until all of his seed is exterminated from the earth. And we know um, 
going forward with the flood and all that, all of the seed of Cain is going to die because when you go through some of these other books, Noah's wife was a son, was a daughter of Enoch, and so was his son's wives were daughters of Enoch, if I'm not mistaken. All of the seed of Cain died. Um, and Abel is bearing that witness, but he's bearing it from this dark place that's set aside for the souls of people in death. At that moment, I raised the question regarding him and regarding the judgment of all. For what reason is one separated from the other? And he replied and said to me, these three, I thought this was interesting. These three have been made in order that the Ruachs of the dead may be set, might be separated. And in the manner in which the souls of the righteous are separated, by this spring of water with light upon it, in like manner, the sinners are set apart. So these three have been made for the spirits of the dead might be separated, those who die. But this is one spot for the righteous when they die it'll have a spring of water with a light. Now, when you, when you read some of the other stories about like Yahushua going into under the earth in the three days he was in the belly of the beast, so to speak. Um, and you got Adam there and Seth is talking and Abraham's there, King David speaks from there. Um, ironically, people like Moshe, Elijah and Enoch, they don't speak from there. Um, but a lot of the prophets speak from there. I know Habit, some of the accounts Habakkuk says something. Yahakanan the Baptist is talking there. Um, they at that time would have been by this spring of water with light, which I assume, I really don't like this term, but I assume this is what we would consider Abraham's bosom. It's a set apart place in darkness for the righteous. Now, after Yahushua comes and get the victory over death, uh, he takes Adam and all of them as my um, Sam reads in the Apocalypse of Paul, when Paul goes to the third level of heaven, which is paradise, and now the righteous wait there. That was part of the getting the victory from death. But even before then, there was a set apart place amongst the darkness for the righteous, which explains, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I should fear no evil because you are with me. And that just shows the two layers to that because the shadow of death can also be confusion and ruin. We are walking through the valley of the shadow of death right now, but we have Yahushua through the word to light our way to keep us on the narrow path. Now in the physical, in the spiritual, he was talking about Sheol. That's a, that's a good example of what we were just discussing. Um, moving on in like manner, the sinners are set apart when they die and are buried in the earth and judgment has not been executed upon them in their lifetime upon this great pain until the great day of judgment and to those who curse there will be plague and pain forever so they're going to be tormented and the retribution of their spirits they will bind them there forever even if from the beginning of the world man i mean <laughs> that just made me think of something that mean like cain and I don't know, Cain might have got his life right before the end, but his, his descendants who were living away, they've been down there being tormented now for a long time. Even if from the beginning of the world, and in this manner is a separation made for the souls of those who make the suit and those who disclose concerning destruction as they were killed in the days of the sinner. Such has been made for the souls of the people who are not righteous, but sinners and perfect criminals, they shall be together with other criminals who are like them, whose souls will not be killed on the day of judgment, but will not rise from there. Um, I'm assuming this is when Yahushua first comes back. Some will be risen to everlasting life. Some will be risen to everlasting shame. But when Yahushua died the first time, I take that back, my fault. I, I thought the wrong way. When Yahushua came and he died the first time, it said that he raised the righteous. He didn't raise the sinners at that time. This day of judgment here, I don't see as the final day of judgment because everybody will be raised to stand in front of Yah. I think this is talking about um, Yahushua the first time when he came and it says that he raised the righteous. But moving on, uh, just to get to the end, um, they shall be together with other criminals who are like them whose souls will not be killed on the day of judgment, but will not rise from there. At that moment, I blessed 
Yahuwah of glory. Yahuwah Kabod, I believe that may be Hebraically. I could be wrong. And I said, Baruch Elohim, master of righteousness who rules forever. Um, it's on you, Nahimi, to start off. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was just going to um, say, um, I never read this before, but when you were reading it, it reminded me of um, Second Ezra um, chapter 7. I think it's um, it's like verses from 36 to 105, where it talks about um, what, hap what happens after someone dies. So it kind of... Um, it kind of backs up um, what is what is said in Second Ezra. So I don't know if anyone's ever read that, but I just wanted to say that. I have, but I would have to read that again as well. I don't have 105 verses of mine. I only have 70. You have one with 105 verses in it? Is it in the Sefer? Yeah, they have the annotated version, the um, one from the one that was published by Cambridge University because it has um, missing verses that they took out of it. Ah, I have to look into that. I never knew that. Hallelujah. Yeah. I'm just learning all kind of things tonight. It's another Israel. Yeah, let me know when you read it because oh, I'd like to know your thoughts. <laughs> I have to read it. I've never read it. Anybody else? Has anybody on the call read it? Got any input to it? Learn all kind of things. That's why you got to. So that's, that's just. I'll put a link in the chat for it. So Thank that's you. just second Ezra's seven that has 105 books or is there is there more books and other chapters of Ezra's that no um there's I know Esther has more verses and and seven um second Ezra seven has more verses than what's showed in the Apoc apocrypha so I, I have like a pdf of it I have the actual book but I found a pdf of it that I'll I'll put it in the chat okay I had a question too, Aki, when no one else, when everyone else is done. It's on you. No hands up. <laughs> I'm trying to find my second Ezra. <laughs> Just like... Right. Um, anyway, all right. So, I, question. So, what we just read. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Was it 22? Not this portion we're looking at. It's 22 because it is a pretty long chapter. Right. So when you were, so I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible that not all of these voices are reaching on to show my name? Uh, would, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. There's a reason I'm asking. Uh, based off of this in my first mind, and I think it's singled out able to let us know that at this time, before Yahushua has come, I would assume that only the righteous who died. Voice reaches unto Shammai. Yes. If you were okay. a sinner. Right. So that, that's how I was reading it. Yeah. Right. That's how I was reading it. It's like these voices were reaching to Shammai. Then he gives you an example of a specific voice, right? Mm -hmm. He says, Abel, um, who you know, Cain had, had killed, right? And then when you, so remember when Yah says, you know, the voice of your brother cries out to me from the ground, right? right? So it, the earth is bearing witness against Cain, right? Um, and we know that life is in the blood, um, but we know that we know that also man can kill the body, they can't kill the Ruach, right? So all of these indicators let us know that, um, the nefesh, the ruach, comes from the Most High. We know that from um, Genesis, you know, two. You know, it, this this tells us that there is a, there is communication that can still occur. But as you're reading through the rest of twenty two, um, Enoch twenty two, you'll keep seeing that there's a separation. This place is for these people, and these people, and these people, and then it keeps mentioning being killed, right? So. I'm assuming that people who have been martyred or killed um, for the sake of Yahuwah, 
um, is the ones whose voices are able to reach into the show. It could be that as well. It could be that as well. Um, it definitely could be that as well. And, and you know, the, our, the irony in that is at this time um, of Enoch doing this, a bell may have been the only person who had been martyred. I don't know if I don't know if Adam has died yet. And even if Adam had died, he wasn't martyred. He died just of old age and natural natural causes at 930 years. Like a bell has been killed because <laughs> of him and his brother's offerings to Yah and his brother not liking Yah's response toward his offering. Man, you about to you about to take the conversation back to the old conversation. I mean, <laughs> don't, do that. don't do that. We gotta get some. We gotta get some chapters here. But I, but, I, that, but, but that's what's going. Playing. That's what's going on. I mean, uh, Hanok is seeing. You know, he's being. He's ceasing behind the veil, so time doesn't exist. This is true. So that, that that's all I'm gonna say. This is true. This I'm is, just that, looking at it that. That's true as well. Um. And we know that Hanuk, as we go further, he is going to see all the way up until today. So I don't want to limit him to like, all right. he's seeing is his time. Because no, he, as we go further, he prophesies all the way up into the end of creation in this book. So no, um, just speaking at the time of this vision, um, physically, right, but spiritually, no, he's he's Abiyah's allowing him to see across time as he does with all of the prophets. As you go through the scripture, all of the prophets at a point in their life had a vision or a word from Yah that was for a time beyond them. Hallelujah. Any more questions or comments of where you go to wait? Darkness for those who are. Um, I know people say that you shouldn't pray for. Well, I don't know if they say you shouldn't, but I know it's not really a thing like you pray for people who die, but I actually pray for people who died a lot. And the reason I do that is because in my life, and this was long before I was even in the truth, I know um, I know some good people who done passed away who never, at least from where I sit, I don't know if they've ever even been privy to the truth. And their doctrine might have been wrong, but it was some ways in their life that Abiy has commanded us to live like. So, I pray for certain people, not all people, because I know some I know some wicked killers too. But I pray for certain people who were just led astray. You know that Abba may have mercy on them. And a lot of times when I pray for them, I ask that if they sit in darkness, that He would send a light to them, um, even in darkness, to show them the error of their ways. Which, you know, I also believe that when you die. Um, I believe that when you die, all things are shown to you as far as like your life and the truth. So uh, I once heard Kifa say that, you know, Bob, y'all being outside of time, I think you said that, you know, when a person dies, like in a blink of an eye, we're going to be at the judgment and everybody's going to be there. I agree with that. And I think that when people die, um, the era of your ways and just the era of the doctrines of this world that we've been under are immediately revealed to you. And you know where you stand um, quickly. Like, I don't believe that the judgment is gonna be like a mystery where I stand with Yah. I believe everybody knows when by the way before you get to that um, moment, but that's just a thought. But yeah, this is, this is a reason, you know, why I pray because there are people waiting in darkness um, who may have just been ignorant. And I, I, you know, I ask for forgiveness and I humbly say that because I'll be, I knows a person hard better than me and he knows if they were really this or that. So um, I probably shouldn't even assume, but I still do pray for quite a few people who have passed on already. Hmm. Moving on though. Um, somebody want to read chapter 23? It's pretty short. The fires of the luminary. So he's still, um, to my belief, he's still he's still on the earth, but now he's gonna, I think, um, speak about the Shemaim a little bit. Anybody want to read these four verses in 23? Sure, I'll go. Hey, real real quick, um, man, we we're all off. 
uh, Toda to, to Nahimi for, for putting that in. And I clicked on her link and went and checked it out. And as y'all would have it, I just purchased another Bible. And my second Ezra is in this Bible has 140 40 verses. So, so wow. Yeah. So, Toda. You know what I think he do tell um, Ezra somewhere in his book, like, hold those 70. I think he said books, but that could just be the translation. I think he does tell Ezra hold like 70, or is that Daniel? One of the yeah. two. When I clicked on her link and saw the, the version she she put in there, it's like, wait a minute, I just bought one of these. Let me, let me check it. And yeah, I've got it. Yeah, sec, second Ezra, second Ezra Zaki. Okay, it is Ezra. Hallelujah. Good looking out, Oxam. But that, 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 you know, that speaks to it. Hallelujah. But go ahead, you're hocking to chapter 23, four verses. Okay. And from there, I depart, oh, excuse me. And from there, I departed and went to another place in the direction of the west until the extreme ends of the earth. And I saw a burning fire which was running without rest. It did not diminish its speed night and day. And I asked saying, what is this thing which has no rest? At that moment, Ragul, one of the holy angels who was with me answered me and said to me, this thing which you saw is the course of the fire. And this, the fire which is burning in the direction of the west is the luminaries of heaven. So first thing I want to state is in ancient times, looking east would have been like the head of what we would call a compass. And looking east would be like almost looking into the future. You know, they would always look east, right? These last few spots as he's getting to these places of darkness and fire and what we would probably consider Sheol, Enoch is traveling further and further west. I, that just stood out to me. And he's calling that the extreme ends of the earth. And you know, that, that actually makes me think about the transatlantic slave trade because we were in the land. And when Abiyah booted us out, um, you know, a lot of us went to a lot of places, but with the transatlantic, we went, um, and they may have been, matter of fact, we know because there were Indians and different things in those areas. It was people who had been that way already. But to the known world, we were taken to the farthest reaches of the West that the quote unquote known world had ever been. Um, and for Enoch to be like it in these places of desolation and ruin and destruction to the West, it makes me think about how the chosen people were taken into the West and now are a destroyed and destruct and ruined as people. Um, hallelujah. Anybody got anything else they want to add to this? I don't even understand what it means when it says these are the luminaries of the heaven and this a fire. Um, that's another thing that's beyond me. No questions or comments here. Okay. Hallelujah. I said that something else is said and it did not diminish its speed night and day. This fire is like a, makes me think of a volcano, almost like lava flowing. It's a continuous flow. Yeah, you know, when you really think about it, it makes sense because they try to tell us that these volcanoes are dormant, but we understand lava is continually flowing under the earth. And that's why these volcanoes can blow at any time, really, even though science tells us that, uh, you know, they'll try to tell us that this and that is 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 uh, dormant, but we know that to not be true. Abba Yah can blow a dormant volcano that they say at any moment. Um, once again, when it says these in the direction of the West is the luminaries of the Shemaim, I don't know that one though. That's something I'll have to dig in deeper to myself. But chapter 24, I think this is another short chapter. It is, I'll pick it up. From there, I went to another place of the earth and he showed me a mountain. See, it didn't say he went west this time. Every time he was going into destruction, it was he went west, he went further west, he went west. This time, it just says that he went to another place on the earth and he showed me a mountain of fire, which was flaming day and night. And I went in this direction and saw seven dignified mountains, possibly angels, 
all different one from the other of precious and beautiful stones and all dignified and glorious in respect to their visual, visual, <laughs> visualization and beautiful in respect to their facade. Three in the direction of the east, one founded on the other, and three in the direction of the north, one upon the other, with deep and crooked ravines, each one of which is removed from the other. The seven mountains were situated in the midst of these ravines ravines and in respect to their heights all assembled all resembled the seat of a throne which is surrounded by fragrant trees and among them there was one tree such as i have never at all smelled there was not a single one among them or other trees which is like it among all the fragrances among all the fragrances nothing could be so fragrant its leaves, its flowers, and its wood would never wither forever. Its fruit is beautiful and resembles the clustered fruits of a palm tree. At that moment, I said, this is a beautiful tree. <laughs> that's funny. I could hear Enoch like, wow, that's a really cool tree. Beautiful to view with leaves so handsome and blossoms, so magnificent in appearance. Then Micaiah, one of the holy and revered angels, he is their chief who was with me, responded to me. Uh, I probably should read 25 because I don't think it's that long. But ironically, he sounded like Eve. This is a tree, good for knowledge and to be touched, beautiful in appearance, right? But he ain't at the tree of knowledge and good and evil. He had a different tree and this may be the tree of life. I'm not even sure, you know? But it, it, it that just sticks out to me how he kind of sounds like how Eve was talking in the garden about the tree. Go ahead, Naomi. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to ask to read. Oh, go ahead. You can pick it up. Chapter 25, seven verses. Okay, thanks. Um, it says, oh, mine only has three verses. Let me look at yours. Okay, it says, and he said unto me, Enoch, what is it that you are asking me concerning the fragrance of this tree? And you are so inquisitive about. At that moment, I answered saying, I am desirous of knowing everything, but especially about this thing. He answered saying, this tall mountain, which you saw, whose summit resembles the throne of Yahuwah is indeed his, his throne on which the holy and great um, Elohim of glory and the eternal king will sit when he descends to the earth with goodness. And as for this fragrant tree, not a single human being has the authority to touch it until the great judgment when he shall take vengeance on all and conclude everything forever. This is for the righteous and the pious and the elect will be presented with its fruit for life. He will plant it in the direction of the Northeast upon the holy place in the direction of the house of Elohim, the eternal King. Then they shall be glad and rejoice in gladness and they shall enter into the holy place. Its fragrance shall penetrate their bones. Long life will they live on earth, such as your fathers live in their days. At that moment, I blessed Yahuwah of glory, the eternal king, for he was prepared, for he has prepared such things for the righteous people as he had created as he had created them and give it to them. Hallelujah. Oh, that actually reminds me of Revelation 22, that tree. It does. Um, it does. It says that it'll be a tree in the mist. And um, it's a couple points that just stood out to me when you said that, when, when you were reading that. You want to read Revelation 22? Sure. Um... Twenty-two. I don't know exactly where it talks. Oh, right here, chapter and verse two. Yeah, 
Um, it says, and he showed me a pure river of water, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of Yahuwah and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Hallelujah. What'd you say? No, I asked if you wanted to keep reading or just stop there. Um, man, stop with a Ruach tell you to. I don't know. <laughs> Y'all well, I mean, been beyond me already tonight, man. I don't know where to tell you to stop, <laughs> but uh interestingly enough, he is a really good possibility that Enoch just saw the tree of life, which is another resemblance of Yahushua, right? Um mm -hmm. something else about this that really stood out. This tall mountain which you saw whose summit resembles the throne of Elohim is indeed his throne on which the Kodesh and great master of glory, the eternal king, will sit when he descends to visit the earth with goodness. We talked about this in here last time. Abiyah has never left the throne. So mm -hmm. now that even makes me think when he was down on Sinai with Moshe, he may have not have left the throne then. He just bowed the heavens on this, you know, right here from this throne and say he descends to visit the earth with goodness. He bowed the heavens here. Um, and it's a few other occasions. He bowed the heavens when he came to see Yahushua on, on the tree, when he was when they when they killed him. Um, I always can think of one other occasion that I'm drawing a blank. But um yeah, it looks like Enoch saw the tree of life. Hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. Surrounded by seven great mountains. Um, and you know what? To the point I was making too, it said that it'll be it talk, he will plant it in the direction of the northeast. And we know that that's going to be in the New Jerusalem from the Revelation 22 as part of the city that's going to come down. So um, upon the holy place in the direction of the house of Yah. So this speaks to how Enoch is study going west, where he was going west, as he kept saying, into destruction, deeper into Sheol, deeper into darkness. And he was seeing these different things that had to do with death and people being tormented. But now when it talks about this tree of life, it's saying that it'll be planted back in the east. Um, and we, um, at least I believe that to be in the vicinity of where Jerusalem is today. Um, although the specks of the land are much bigger than that, it's going to be like a lot. It's going to be like half Africa, half of what they call Europe, all of the Middle East, most of like Asia, like the specks of what they call the New Jerusalem, if you break down the cubits, is like huge. Um, really huge but it's just ironic that he's going to plant this tree back in the east as he's been going west to see all this destruction yeah it's on you just the thought and well more more of an observation of something that i'm just seeing over and over in the word and i was thinking it earlier when you guys were making the points um about revelation and how it's, it's sort of mirroring different things but just this is blatantly pointing out that everything that's happening in the Shamaim or everything that exists in the Shamaim already exists on earth. It's like a mirror. True. Yeah. And so I just wanted to point that out because literally he's got a seat there. He's got a seat here. It's just not able to be touched by man. So there are all these places on earth because I think we brought that out last time um, when we were talking about Antarctica and how there are areas of the earth the church is not able to get to or touch. And I believe that's purposeful because it has its place, but just not for, for it. He walks in and out of time and it's just not for us to be able to touch right now. So I just wanted to point that out, hallelujah. It also makes me wonder with all of this satellites when they be looking down on the earth and um, like you say, Antarctica is really off limits. Um, have they, I don't necessarily know if they've seen, and I definitely don't know if I'll be, I will allow them to even get in the vicinity of, but are they looking for these places? It's on you, Akifa. Oh, can I say one more thing? Go ahead. 
there's an um the reason why I thought that thought too, and what just jogged my memory when you said that. There's a Norse myth. I like I like mythology, and I've like always been drawn to mythology all my life. Um, there's a Norse myth about the Christmas tree that uh, is it talks about uh, uh, what do you call that uh, aurora borealis that uh, that pattern of uh, the northern lights. Mm -hmm. Basically, the, it, the myth goes something like there were seven trees or, or so many trees. I, mean, I may have the number wrong, but there were so many trees in a grove. And it's like basically the opposite to the father's story. It's like the polar opposite to the father's story. Um, but they basically say the reason why they cross the planks across the edge of the Christmas tree is because it's pointing the direct at the end of the earth or where that, those trees used to sit. The trees were all chopped down, basically. Um, and basically they held the spirits of uh, all the, the, the great magic on the earth or something like that. And they were chopped down. And basically the reason why they have a Christmas tree or why they pay homage to a Christmas tree is because um, it actually is pointing out the direction in those trees is somewhere where those trees are located. The lights are still there because it's reminiscent of the magic that was once there, but it was chopped down. And they put an X on the bottom of the tree because it basically the roots were cut off so that you would never be able to get basically back to everlasting life. What would be everlasting life for good people, but in the North Norse myth, it's um, representative of their evil people being cut off. It's like the, the story, I know I'm getting the story not exactly right, but it's it's basically the polar opposite to what is happening or what should have happened in, in the biblical story with the trees, but it, it further explains it. I, I will look it up and have the exact story for y'all because it, it literally, when you hear the story, it literally looks like the background or they're, they're the evil representation of what they're saying is happening on to our story, to the biblical story. But I'll look it up and get it together so that I can bring it out next time. Hallelujah. You know what, you made a good point. Mythology, how you said it's the complete opposite of Abiyah's story and because the mythology of the world are, are the doctrines of the devil and it would be, you know, sprinkle in something that makes sense. And, completely corrupted to get us off the path. Um, so it definitely makes sense that they would give us a hat or they're, they're, they have a, a, a story where it's the complete opposite because that's always what Hasatan has, has done. Take some of this truth, add his own twist and throw it all off. And that's how you got uh, religion and mythology that's how you get all of that zeus and all of that ain't nothing but fallen angels and giants but it's taught to the world like these was the gods in such a great time to live under the no them nephilim when them, them them demigods that they you know they tell us about demigods hercules and achilles and they talk about these people like they great heroes but realistically if that's a god and it slept with a woman a, a man and had a baby Biblically, that's a Nephilim. So that, that, I, I like that you showed that difference like that because that's exactly what Hasatan does. It's on you, Akifa, and me and Aksam, if you want to speak about the Book of Hermes from the chat. Toda, I was just going to say that um, the first thing I was going to say um, was to Yohakana, if you know what she said is true, like a lot of these things that we see in the Shamayim, we see on earth, just train your mind train your mind to think of it the other way around. A lot of things that we have on earth already existed in the Shamayim. And that'll help, that'll help with the processing of like what we were talking about in, in Revelations, right? And it's, it's a mindset that you have to, you've got to, you've got to train your mind to understand it that way. And then you'll start, you'll start understanding the, the Ruach aspects of these things. Um, but also the, um, you know, sometimes I wonder, she brought out the, the, the thing about the mythology. Um, a lot of those, a lot of these mythologies are like, sometimes I wonder if, you know, I know that some of them, they were beholden to fallen Malachim, um, and that's where they got some of these stories, um, or, 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 or in the fall, or Nephilims. 
um, is where they got some of these stories. But sometimes it's a perversion of what you know the truth is, right? And it's, you know, because like if you, when you listen to it, it makes sense on a certain aspect. Of course, we know it's not true, but it's it, if you, if you imagine you're listening to someone who doesn't understand trying to explain something is how I see, you know, the mythology, right? They're trying to, you know, the, the Malachim are trying to get them to understand um, certain secrets, certain things that, you know, may have happened. And they're trying to explain it to us in the best way that they can. So, yeah. No, hallelujah. And even further than that, um, it's, it's possible that, because, you know, they were carving things on stone. Um, it's possible that some of the pre-flood, because everybody would have spoke Hebrew pre-flood, all of the men, right? Cain and Abel both would have had learned that from Adam, and Cain would have passed that to his children. So it's very possible that there were carvings and rocks and things like that that lasted after the flood that men picked back up and re started to regurgitate and reach uh, teach as well. This you you didn't even bring out the you didn't even bring out the angle of the trees. This could this we would have never made it out if you had brought that out. Man, <laughs> it's so much. This book of Enoch, you know. Um, I said that and I really meant that, man. I, I read this, but I've never studied it. You know, it's the difference between reading and studying. And as we've been going through this together, like I really say Toda, because I've learned a lot. Um, you all have just put a lot on my mind in general. It's a lot. It's a lot. I mean, Like I say, if we was doing this a chapter a day, it would take us two years to finish, but we could easily focus on a chapter a day in so many revelations. Just want to say, Oxam, Oxam be holding out too. Yeah, I was going to say. I just want to throw that out there. Him next. Do you want to speak towards um, the book of Hermes, what you were saying, Oxam? I've never read that book, actually. <laughs> um, all praises to you, who uh, I think. Thank you, Akifa. I, you know, I... I when I get on these calls, I just like to listen and absorb. And when the time is right to speak, I'll hop in like now. But <laughs> thank you, though. Um, and honestly, no, not really. I don't really have much to say in regards to it because, and I was telling uh, Koti Nehemi in the chat, or Nehemi, I apologize if I pronounced it wrong, but um, The Shepherd of Hermes is, is one of those books that um, I would say is a definite must for us to read. And you know, it really changed my whole perspective on uh, just our growth with the father and, and, you know, our walk with him. And apparently uh, one of the messengers that was speaking to Enoch and I believe Ezra as well is, uh, I believe it was maybe surreal i'm not too sure but one of them one of the arch archangels was the same one speaking to hermes and a lot of things in that book is similar to uh, the revelations and visions um and enoch but i would say it's more prevalent to the our growth and our walk with yeah more so but um the part about the mountains uh the part about the mountains and uh, the shepherd of hermes just like with what you were saying, Akifa, about the spiritual realm being the dominant force over the natural, the same way how we have different mountain ranges here on the earth, um, I believe that to be true also for the spiritual realm, like how the mountains were described here in Enoch, the seven mountains, that's like one area in the realm of the spirit that has uh, symbols attached to what those mountains mean. And according to Shepherd of Hermes, there's 12 other ones in a different part in the spiritual realm that mean another thing, but they still appear to be mountains until it's explained to you by a messenger what they actually mean. And so I just wanted to throw that out there, but I would definitely read it um, as Yah leads you to. Um, I'm about to make you real ecstatic. So I got so many books, Aki, and <laughs> <laughs> like 
you know, I, I've read most <laughs> of them. And when when I saw you put in the chat, or I saw a, a Koti Mimi put in the chat um, about the lost books. So I look back on my shelf and the lost books of the Bible, I've had this book probably for 30 some years. And I, I went and grabbed it and looked and just realized that the Shepherd of Hermes is in there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have wow. to, I've had this book, I've had this book so long, the pages are like, they turn in yellow and like, so. <laughs> Well, I gotta be digging in my crates tonight. <laughs> yeah, I um, I have a video on YouTube about uh, a study on it in regards to fasting from the Shepherd of Hermes, but I actually need to reread it again because it's one of those books that um, you just can't read just once and then just you know you're done with it. You know, I'm about to pick. That. But yeah, I gotta get my reading game back up. I I. I do so much studying for my lesson during the week that I don't get to read much else, but I'm going to have to find time oh, yeah. to start reading. Hallelujah. I've, like I said, I've never read The Shepherd of Hermes either. I've come across it a few times. Um, I'm going to have to put it on my list of things to do as well. Um, hallelujah. See, the time is ticking down. Chapter 26 and 27 are short, and it's going to speak further to trees. Uh, I'm going to knock it out while we're here. Um, and you know, what? I, it's funny that the header of this is Jerusalem, because I was going to say, in the letter of Aristius, I believe his name is, is at the time when um, Ptolemy was writing the Septuagint around 2-300 BC in that range. And he had sent to Jerusalem, which it was one of the Maccabees, who was the high priest. Uh, and they picked 72 elders of each tribe, um, which lets us know that it was all Israel and Jerusalem. It wasn't just the Yehudian. And as we get 300 years later to the New Testament, they're kind of like frowning down upon the rest of Israel. I feel like it's all about Judah, but just right before it in the time of the Maccabees, it was all Israelites there. And um, Aristius, who was the Greek, when he went to Jerusalem to present the idea to them and all these gifts that Ptolemy told, he detailed Jerusalem or Jerusalem, some say. And he, it was just like he just said with these seven mountains. He was like the temple mount set in the midst of seven mountains. Um, he described it exactly or very similar to these seven mountains and all of that. And I just say that because as we go into 26, the header talks about Jerusalem and its surroundings. Remember at the time of Anak, Spiritually, he's seeing across time, but physically at the time of this vision, when he first gets this vision in his physical life, there is no Jerusalem, right? Um, chapter 26, verse one, it says, and from there, I went into the center of the earth. There are other books that says that Israel or Yasharal slash Jerusalem is the center of the planet, which also leads to a flat earth plane again, right? But there are other extra books that talks about Jerusalem as the center of the world. And he says, I went into the center of the earth and I saw a blessed place shaded with branches with live and bloom from a tree that was cut. That's interesting. And there I saw a holy mountain, Kodesh mountain, underneath the mountain in the direction of the east, which the direction of the east is looking towards the narrow path of Yah, for lack of a better word. There was a stream which was flowing in the direction of the north. And I saw in a second direction another mountain, which was higher than the former. Between them was a deep and narrow valley. In the direction of the latter mountain ran a stream in the direction of the west. From this one, there was yet another mountain, smaller than it and not so high, with a valley under it. And between them, besides another valley, which is deep and dry, the valleys were narrow formed formed of hard rocks and no tree growing on them. And I marveled at the mountains and I marveled at the valley. I marveled very deeply. So he's looking at um, these mountains and these valleys with these streams and what he's calling the center of the earth. And he says that no tree was growing um, on them, right? Chapter 27, it's a short one as well. 
At that moment, I said, for what purpose does this blessed land entirely filled with trees have in its midst this accursed valley? So in the midst of this, and I'm, I'm sorry, there's trees in this spot, but on this, on the, in this valley that was narrow, formed of hard rocks, there was no trees. He's saying that it's an accursed valley amongst this beautiful place, right? And he's like, why is this place here? And he says, then Uriel, one of the holy angels, or Kodesh Melachim, who was with me, answered me and said to me, this accursed valley is for those accursed forever. Here will gather together all those accursed ones, those who speak with their mouth unbecoming words against Yahuwah and utter hard words concerning his glory. Here shall they be gathered together and here shall be their judgment. Sound like Armageddon. Um, I can't think of the Hebrew word or it might be. But here will be their judgment in the last days. There will be upon them the spectacle of righteous judgment in the presence of the righteous forever. They're going to surround um, the set apart, right? I think that's how Revelation go, paraphrasing. And then I believe I'll be always going to rain fire from the sky, something like that. The merciful... <gasps> The merciful will bless Yahuwah, master of glory, the eternal king all the day. In the days of the judgment of the accursed, the merciful shall bless him for the mercy which he, have, which he had bestowed upon them. At that moment, I blessed the most high Yah, master of glory, and gave him the praise that befits his glory. Um, and I just like that breakdown. Um, I don't know who all, if anybody on the call ever had the chance to go to um, Yasharal or the, the sliver of it that they have today, but I know that it is a mountainous region. Um, and he's talking about how in the midst of the beautiful city, it's an accursed valley, which makes sense because amongst our people, always, there has always been, even amongst the, the set apart covenanted people, there's always been um, naysayers, for lack of a better word. Hallelujah. Um, and he's just breaking down the center of the earth, which he's calling Jerusalem and showing how it's a land of milk and honey. It's a plush land, trees and streams. Um, it's funny because it's not like that no more. It's a lot of desert. I don't know if it's that many streams, right? Um, which speaks to how Abiyas is as the Gentiles running underfoot. It'd be like a desolate place. Um, even the places over there, I, I seen a, a beautiful garden they have over there. And when I was reading into it, it was like they had to import the grass and the trees, like nothing's natural there. They're like importing it from other places, trying to make it look like that, right? Um, but just lastly, ending on chapters 26 and 27, um, anybody got anything they want to speak about this last place, these mountains and these trees and this accursed valley? Hallelujah. We're going to get a chance to visit Jer. I got hope. I always wanted to go there as well. Uh, it say it had with branches which live bloom from a tree that was cut. Uh, I think Akifa, when he was talking about the trees earlier, I do believe that I believe that everything was bigger pre-flood. I believe there were some really big trees. Um, Possibly some of these mountain ranges we see now could be fossilized trees, like you never know. Um, but I do believe that there were some really big trees on the earth at the time. So to say that this place was a bloom from a tree that was cut um, at the time when Hanak's talking, if we're talking in his physical time, um, if it was a tree cut pre-flood, this this could have been a, a massive tree. It's on you, Naomi. Um, I actually I had a question. And I'm sorry, cause it's kind of off topic, <laughs> but I was wondering, um, do you, do you guys think that, um, cause I've, I've watched some videos. I watched a video actually a while back on YouTube. Someone was, um, it was sent to me and someone was talking about um, how the ancient Israel, like today, um, parts of it includes the, um, the Middle East and Northeast Africa. Mm -hmm. So um, I was wondering what you guys thoughts was on that. Um, well, 
what we call the Middle East today in ancient times and antiquity, I believe they would say it was always considered to be North Africa anyway, at least like half of it or maybe even three fourths, maybe sure. all the way to the border of India. Um, with that said, if you do the specs on like in Joshua when they're breaking down the land, um, ancient Israel back then when it was one nation, um, so to speak, under Dawid and Solomon, it would have stretched from um, Goshen all the way down in Egypt up to, I don't even know how far it would have stretched north, but I know like what we call today Turkey and Syria, Jordan, all of those nations, um, maybe even parts of Persia going into what uh, Persia, which is anciently is now Iran, um, probably parts of Saudi Arabia and the southern part towards the boot, which goes now by Ethiopia. Um, yeah, ancient Israel would have covered a lot of that. It would have covered a lot of that. That's, that is true. And that also speaks to, like you read that Revelation 22, because when you, when you, when you, if you cube it up the specs of the new Jerusalem, and maybe I think he sends through and gives you the specs in Ezekiel, I could be wrong, but it's like way bigger than even ancient Israel. And ancient mm -hmm. Israel was 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 the majority of what we of what we like I say back then it was considered Northeast Africa, but the majority of what we would today call the Middle East was ancient Israel. That is a fact. Mm, okay. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, true indeed. And when Hanak is having this vision, he's probably talking about across all of that. Um, real talk because he wouldn't look at it like in its fallen state he would be speaking about it in its glory which is definitely something i would like to go see too but you know we might have to ain't no ain't no might the way the world is we are going to have to wait on y'all to make a way but you know call me crazy but i'm just that type of believer in the middle of these vaccine mandates and all that if it's meant for us to go y'all make a way for us right now and I believe that. So hallelujah. That's another thing that I pray. I would really like to see it. And it may not be meant for us to see. Y'all may be saying, y'all just hold tight. You ain't missing nothing. They done ran it down. <laughs> you know, let me just wait, man. I'm gonna go show it to you when I make it back glorious again. Hallelujah. Told our Rabah for everybody coming. It was another good read. We got 27, we got to chapter 27. We making progress, man. Only another 90 chapters to go. <laughs> Hallelujah. Any questions or comments on anything we read today before we go? I'm about to read on this chapter 23 again. I don't know exactly what it's trying to say right here with these fires and these luminaries. That was something interesting. I'm gonna read Revelation again. Y'all to put that on my heart. Let me write that down. First Enoch 23, read again. If don't nobody got none, uh, Ock Sam, take us out in prayer, Ock. All right, I got you. Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of your son, Yahushua HaMashiach, I thank you for allowing us to gather here to learn more about your word, Abba, the words that you spoke through your servant, Enoch, Abba, to us and this time and this generation. Thank you, Father, for teaching us what we need to know, Father, what we need to learn. Father, learning about the true structure of your, your physical earth, Father, and even the spiritual realm. Thank you, Father, for teaching us and for counting us worthy to have this book, even in our generation. We thank you, Father, for waking us up according to your purpose and to your timing. Abba, I just ask that. You can help us to continually remain in your presence, Father, to remain guarded up, Father, against any evil attack of the enemy, Abba, that would try to just throw us off guard, Father, for the remainder of this week. I pray, Abba, that you can help us to remain in your word. We love you and we thank you. And we thank you, Father, for just allowing this book to be put on the heart of your son, Father Agdre, for it to read it to us and so that we can have discourse and fellowship together. We give you this time and we thank you, Father. In the mighty name of your son, Yahushua HaMashiach, 
Hallelujah. 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 Great prayer, Aki. Um, and I just thank God before all of us actually coming together to fellowship and um having a meeting of the minds um in the spirit of Abiya to flesh this out. Uh, Enoch is, you know, it's a big read. It has some big ideas in it, and I think it's only fitting that we come together together and see what we can come up with. Oh yeah. I just found out that Oxam is is in my head. Really? He's you. Yeah, man. He's he's hijacking <laughs> all of my resources. Like he's got all, all my secret websites that I use. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey. Yeah, there's some deep research a while ago. I was like, man, this is that 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 website there is a gem. You know, you it's yeah, it can be me, on there for you. Yeah, so for all of y'all on the um, the reason I had never found it in there, I'd, I'd have to show you my, Akdre knows about it, but I'd have to show you my my Word app that I use when I do my lessons. Like I've got a lot of uh, stuff put in there that I normally don't bring out when I do my lessons, but I started with the early Jewish writings. Um, so for all of y'all on the call, if you want to like research other books and stuff like that, it's this is, it's one word. Um, earlyjewishwritings.com um, and you can also check earlychristianwritings.com each one will lead you to the other so those are those are two good uh two good websites to to have hallelujah and most of the stuff he is online for free you're right um i personally i'm i'm old-fashioned um I'll find a book online or even i listen i've listened to a lot of these extra books on youtube first and if it piques my interest, then I have to buy a copy. I got to be able to write in it. I got to be able to feel it, see it, touch it. Um, but most of these things that we go through, um, you can find them for free online. Um, yeah, yeah. Most of these extra books, um, not all of them, but most of these you can find online to read for free. Archive.org is another good uh, gem. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, can you repeat what you said about the Jewish writings? Yeah, I'm a, let me type it in the let me type it in the chat. No problem. So not for coming, uh Nahimi. What was that? So for coming. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. No problem. This um study has really been a blessing to me because um I've always wanted to just understand scripture as scripture as it's written and like all of the assemblies I've been to in the past there's always like a doctrine behind the scripture and I just wanted to understand it plain so I, I'm getting a lot from you know all the studies that um we have with Goshen group hallelujah no doctrine here we stated that on the first day we weren't trying to prove nothing right or wrong we just reading and seeing where i'll be i'll be i'll lead us we're not trying to create anything we ain't trying to take away from nothing yeah that's it's really yeah important yeah we just trying to build on you know whatever i'll be y'all shows whatever as i sam said in his prayer i say that a lot too my um aki whatever i'll be y'all feels that we are worthy to know Hallelujah, because it says in scripture, I haven't even told the angels a lot of these things. So um, it's also a scripture that talks about how kings and princes search after wisdom in the word of Yah and they never find it. So that was told out of you. And that was just special that you would pray that prayer because that is true. Um, if I didn't want us to know and understand these things, we would not. Um, and we also see in scripture where Abiyah says he's giving people over to strong delusions so they never know. So, yeah, that's another reason. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, a, it's, yeah. A, it's a double-edged sword, man. Like a lot of this stuff I've researched all my life and didn't really understand it. True. But the, 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 the other side of that is when you, when you understand the depth of it, it's actually painful. And um, like with with knowledge comes comes pain. So like, yeah, it's 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 you know I'm not saying not to not to seek it out, not to understand these things, but yeah, it it, work, it cuts both ways. You're right. 
Maybe that's why he chose us. We had the right temperament. <laughs> yeah, and that's why he showed us when he showed us because we, yeah. you know, we couldn't handle it before. I mean, you know, I know it's getting late, but when I first came into the truth, I was angry. I was angry. I was angry at the people around me. I was angry at my elders because, I, you know, in my family, it's a lot of educated people. I was angry. Like, how dare you just pass us Christianity? You ain't even studied. Because when I would go ask certain questions, I realized that the elders, the people who I love, you know, that did the most for me as a child coming up in the hood where it was rough. You know, my upbringing was rough. And it's like, dang, but you didn't just sold me this image of this Messiah and all that. And now that I'm asking you simple questions, you don't even know. You haven't even researched this. You've just passed it down. So you do have to have a temperament for this because it will it will, it's emotional. Um, this journey with Abiyah is emotional is the best way I can put it. But he is calling us though. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Joy, you know? Hallelujah. He is calling us though. I pray that as well. Abiyah, give us all the temperament to go forward and to spread your word with compassion, um, humility, um, remembering that we were just like the people we were talking about yesterday um, yep. and just lead us forward you know that's something i had to learn and i'm thankful that i'll be i humbled me because i was fiery and <laughs> i was just like man it was a point where i couldn't talk to nobody in my family and uh let that be a testimony to anybody who's struggling with that because it was a point where i was completely estranged from everybody in my family i got a big family too four or five sisters brothers two brothers 30, you know what I'm saying? My grandmother had nine kids, 30 grandkids. And we all grew up close in my granny's house. And it was a point where I couldn't have a conversation with none of them because of my own, because I was angry and I didn't know how to convey that. And over time, Abi has constructed me now to where every time something happened, I'm saying people on the phone, what you say the Bible said about? So I say told off, <laughs> but it's, it's like that though. You know, we all have to grow to that. I talk to everybody now. I don't have enough time to do nothing. All I do is sit on the phone and get on Zoom. That's my life. And I'm thankful for that. I ain't saying that like I'm complaining. I'm thankful that Abi has found me worthy to be able to relay his message. And I pray that he allow us all, like I say, humbly give us the compassion, put the words in our mouth, Abi And uh, man, I don't know if I got the juice, but I'm trying, Doc. It's a lot to be learned, man. Y'all done stumped me four, five times here tonight. <laughs> That ain't the juice. I'm on milk still. Hallelujah. I'll talk to y'all later. Layla Tov, everybody. Layla Tov. Layla Tov, family. I have a Layla Tov. Layla Tov.